Hello, welcome to lecture 24 of the course. This is lecture number 3 of module 3. In this lecture, we will continue our discussion on basic physics qualitatively. Then uh, we will start discussing the so-called fluctuation dissipation theorem, which will be very important for our later classes. So let us begin. In the last class, we discussed about the quality factor Q of a febripero cavity and we saw that quality factor and finesse of the cavity are related very closely. In fact, they are actually the same, only quality factor is, is expressed in a different frequency unit than that of the finesse. And quality factor and finesse both refers to the fact that uh, for example, say Q is equal to 10 to the power say 6, that means that the photon will oscillate inside the cavity around 1 million times or 10 to the power 6 number of times. Then we started discussing cavity optomechanical system and firstly based on uh, logic we tried to guess the Hamiltonian of the cavity optomechanical system. The total Hamiltonian of the cavity mechanical system will consist of primarily five parts. One is due to the optical photon inside the cavity and optical photon as we know that it is basically a harmonic oscillator. Then the mechanical oscillator which is basically due to the movable mirror that is uh, vibrating uh, in the range of gigahertz or kilohertz. Okay, so they are basically uh, by quanta of vibration, they are called phonons. So that is also again another harmonic oscillator. And then there is interaction between optical photon and uh, phonon. And that is because of the fact that when the phonon, photon hits the movable mirror, it displays this, displaces the mirror by an amount x and uh, thereby uh, both photon and phonon get coupled by the parameter x. And this laser uh, cavity optomechanical system is driven by a laser. Apart from that term, there are other terms uh, due to the uh, dissipation because both the photon as well as the phonon may decay. And then uh, because we know that the cavity photon is basically a harmonic oscillator and now this resonance frequency of the oscillator is uh, dependent on the uh, displacement of the movable mirror. So based on this, uh, if the displacement of the mirror is very small, then we got the two terms. So one is due to the uh, cavity photon that is circulating inside the cavity and another one is the optomechanical interaction term. And we also see uh, saw how the radiation pressure force can be very easily worked out and this is related to the number of force, uh, number of photon inside the cavity as well as the, the bare optical cavity resonance frequency. And the uh, optomechanical interaction Hamiltonian term can be expressed in a very convenient form like this. Uh, uh, okay, so that's uh, what we did in the last class and we were able to write down the full uh, Hamiltonian of the uh, cavity optomechanical system. However, we are not discussing uh, how to write the expression for the dissipation term and the laser drive time, which we will do it in a later class. After that, we started discussing the basic physics of a cavity optomechanical system in a qualitative way, assuming that the, the photon that is uh, getting incident on this movable mirror reacts uh, instantaneously to the position of the uh, mechanical mirror. Uh, this we can assume provided this mechanical mirror uh, moves very, very slowly. So this is basically the static case. And under this static case, uh, we discussing the so-called optical spring effect. What happened is that because this mechanical oscillator is basically a spring, it's a oscillator, it's a harmonic oscillator. So it has a intrinsic spring constant, but due to the radiation pressure force, the spring constant of the mechanical oscillator can be modified and that is what this um, that comes due to the 
radiation pressure force this is also we discussed in the last class and we have taken another perspective where this uh, whole thing could be understood using the radiation potential because the radiation potential is uh, and force is related because force is equal to uh, the negative of the uh, derivative of the potential with respect to the position as you can see from here and this will result in a staircase kind of a potential and this potential has to be added to the harmonic oscillator potential which is the, basically the intrinsic potential of the mechanical oscillator then the resultant potential will look like this blue curve here and based on this we saw that and we discussed that we obtain the what is the phenomena called multi-stability because we can have a number of local minimum also we saw that the restoring force and the radiation pressure force in a typical cavity optomechanical system they may balances at some points for example here in this uh, figure at point a b and c the radiation pressure force is exactly equal to the restoring force uh, however only the point a and c are um, stable and b is unstable because here as you see in the case of the point b the radiation pressure force is exceeding the restorate restoring it is in the uh, increasing direction at the point b on the other hand at point a and c the restoring force is in the increasing direction so therefore point a and c that means when the mirror movable mirror is at the location a or at the location c then it will have a stable position and in fact this uh, the whole effect all these things have been experimentally observed demonstrated way back in 1980s by a Harvard water group uh, for the first time so now because so far whatever we have discussed we assume that the light react instantaneously to the position of the mechanical object that means the force is always an instantaneous function of position but it is not actually the reality now let us consider a cavity optomechanical system driven by a laser light if the laser light satisfy the resonance condition of the cavity then light will be able to enter into this cavity and there will be circulating light inside the cavity and this movable mirror say it displaces by uh, let me denote the variable by x as usual uh, now let us switch off the laser light then what happens at first instant the circulating light intensity uh, is still the same as before however the as time goes on the light will leak away out of the cavity and slowly the circulating power will decrease or diminish so circulating power would diminish with time because the photon is leaking away from the uh, from the cavity okay and the rate at which the energy inside the cavity decreases is called the cavity decay rate and it is denoted by this symbol kappa and this is called the cavity decay rate cavity decay rate uh, kappa unless uh, the mechanical motion is really slow we have to take uh, this cavity decay rate into account let us consider uh, uh, the radiation pressure force against position plot again to understand this uh, little bit more clearly so we have this usual plot uh, radiation pressure versus position and we already know that we are radiation pressure will vary like this we'll just consider only one of the peak only and by the way the same kind of plot we are going to get for the circulating in intensity inside the cavity as well now if i if we consider that the mirror is starting at some location say at this location say this is location let me denote it by a uh, and this mirror here is moving very very slowly then 
as the position of the mirror is moved towards right move towards right then you can see that the force will increase as we move towards the mirror moves towards right on the other hand if it moves towards left the force will decrease this is easy to see if the motion of the mirror is very slow then there is no appreciable effect of the finite cavity decay rate we do not have to bother about the cavity decay rate at this stage now let us consider the case where the motion is not that slow that means this mirror is moving with some finite velocity it's very small velocity it's not the static case this is the case for the uh, dynamics and in that case the this uh, diagram would a little bit modified and what we are i'm that this is what i'm going to explain what we are going to get is this uh, let me just plot it so we'll get a kind of this kind of a plot if the mirror is moving uh, with some finite velocity the movable mirror is moving with finite velocity let me explain what's going on here uh, as the mirror is moving towards right the light intensity for some time still remains low so suppose we are now here okay we are at this stage this is the static case so let me draw it a little bit with a different okay so this is the dynamic case now the mirror is moving towards right with some finite velocity and therefore the light intensity for some time still remains low uh, compared to the static case because the cavity still has to fill up the light corresponding to what would have would be expected for the new position so we are slightly below the usual curve that is the static one of the force versus position then as we complete the cycle that means if we go like this and go suppose now we reach this position now that means we are going moving back to the left the light intensity for some time here will remain higher compared to the usual static case this red one you see uh, red dot the light intensity would be higher here because the light has to leak out of the cavity and it takes some time okay so this is the reason we get uh, such kind of an ellipse uh, if we draw the force uh, versus position plot for such a situation we must take the ca finite cavity decay rate into account so this has actually important consequences for example the work done by the radiation pressure force uh, in the on the mechanical object would be given by this expression so that would be this close integral this is the radiation f dx force into displacement now if we look at the plot carefully here then we will see that uh, when we are here at the lower lower uh, point the both the radiation pressure force and dx displacement has the same sign uh, while moving towards right right uh, of course uh, in that case the contribution is lower than the usual one on the other hand uh, force and dx uh, this force and dx would have opposite sign uh, when the mirror moves towards left and has higher contribution than the usual one so overall what is obtained is this overall this integration this integration would be less than zero because the negative contribution will be higher when we are at this location of the reson resonance curve that means resonance peak is at this location so we are at the left of the resonance peak uh, then uh, this integration this work done basically work done would be less than uh, less than zero and what it physically mean is that the radiation pressure in such a cycle extract energy from the mechanical motion so 
the radiation pressure for radiation pressure force radiation or simply radiation force uh, extract or rather let me say light because the radiation pressure pressure force is due to light so i can say that light extracts extracts energy from the uh, mechanical motion from the mechanical motion and if energy is extracted from the mechanical motion so that will result in the so-called damping of the mechanical motion and this is known as optomechanical damping optomechanical damping by the way this kind of calculations were done by uh, the russian physicist uh, brezinski brezinski and his co-workers his co-workers way back in 1970 this kind of analysis were done and this phenomenon is also called uh, as i said it's called optomechanical damping and such a mechanical object is you know this kind of cantilever is usually this kind of cantilever is usually coupled to fluctuating thermal environment and because of this damping force which is usually associated with uh, little noise it is also cools the mechanical mirror so very simply as we have seen because the light is extracting energy from the mechanical mirror so as a result the mechanical mirror is getting cooled down and this phenomena is extremely important and we will discuss it in great details later on also quantitatively and this is called optomechanical cooling and by this process we can actually it's a kind of a laser cooling in fact it is laser cooling on the other hand if we go to the other side here if we go to the other side and if we do the analysis here in this side what turns out that this work done would turn out to be greater than zero and what does it mean it means that the radiation pressure force work done due to the radiation pressure force is greater than zero means the light is going to dump energy into the mechanical oscillator or the mechanical mirror and this will result in anti-damping or heating it's it will result in anti-damping and heating or heating and if it heats basically the more because already as i said this mechanical oscillator is coupled to thermal environment and if heating further heating takes place this thermal excitation will increase further and also if this effect is pronounced then it all it will also result in instability now we should be able to read out what's going on within the cavity in order to analyze the phenomenon associated with the static and dynamic cases which we have already discussed this is easy because uh, the cavity is simply an interferometer uh, so this is going to lead us to a discussion on what is called displacement readout uh, if the back mirror of this optomechanical system so say this mirror is perfectly reflecting then whatever the light is getting incident on this cantilever because this is perfectly reflecting it will uh, re completely reflected back and the reflected light will uh, suffer a phase shift now people or experimentalists look at this phase shift as a function of the position a typical plot is uh, plotted here in the phase shift versus position as you can see from this diagram so initially uh, when you are away from the resonance as you see here there is no uh, phase shift the phase shift is there is no change in phase shift basically it is constant because whatever light is getting incident that is get, getting reflected back from the front mirror itself because light would be able to enter into the cavity only if the resonance condition is satisfied and when the resonance condition is satisfied light enters and it get reflected from the back mirror and then there would be phase 
scenes and this is what is reflected in the slope here so there is a phase change and again as we uh, move the mirror further then the resonance condition would not be satisfied and the light would get reflected back from the front mirror itself and the phase scenes will again remain the same and there will be no phase shift actually so phase shift would be given by uh, uh, actually can be worked out and if it is worked out then it turns out that the phase shift is directly proportional to the displacement of the mirror uh, displacement of the mirror and it inversely proportional to the uh, cavity decay rate so if the cavity decay rate is very small uh, cavity decay rate kappa has to be a small k small means theta large so we'll be able to have a significant uh, phase shift which would be uh, easy to measure and if kappa or the cavity decay rate is small that means the it means the quality factor or the finesse of the cavity has to be large and the, what does it mean that means that the uh, the number of oscillations the photon will make inside the cavity will be large or in in other word it means that the photon will survive inside the cavity for longer amount of time and this is the reason why in cavity optomechanical system we need to have a uh, we require a high Q cavity or high finish cavity. So, uh, you see, uh, from phase information, as you can see from this expression, from phase information, we can have the information about the displacement of the mirror, and one can actually plot uh, the displacement versus time curve for the mechanical oscillator, and a typical plot will look like this here this i have taken from the uh, review paper cavity optomechanics now you see the mirror is oscillating with a eigen i'm just considering here only one eigen or normal modes of vibration is considered one normal mode of vibration of uh, mode of say oscillation of the mechanical oscillator is considered and here this gamma refers to the uh, damping rate of the me mechanical oscillator damping rate of the rate of the mechanical uh, mechanical oscillator somewhere we have taken gamma m like this but it is the same thing so initially as you see from the plot the amplitude rises here as you see amplitude rises uh, because the thermal fluctuation from outside heats up the motion and with time this fluctuation gets weakened so it become weak uh, and uh, the amplitude also depletes now the question is how large the variance of this fluctuation uh, quantified by the variance of this harmonic oscillator or the mechanical oscillator so you recall that variance is given by this expression so delta x square is equal to x square average minus average of x square but for harmonic oscillator we know already that the expectation value of x is zero so therefore variance would be given by only this quantity now how we can estimate it this is easy uh, we can do that by using uh, the so-called equipartition theorem so using equipartition theorem we can estimate the variance let me show you uh, it's very straightforward so uh, we know that the the energy of the harmonic oscillator is half kx square or m omega square omega is the oscillation frequency of the oscillator and then this is the variance and this has to be equal to half kbt okay because we are considering one mode of oscillation so it implies that this variance is or x square is equal to kbt by m omega square 
so the amplitude of the fluctuation so it, it implies that the amplitude amplitude of fluctuations varies like square root of temperature okay this is easy to see however and in fact this is what is uh, shown here that it is this amplitude is directly proportional to square root of temperature so thereby we can extract information about the temperatures just by measuring the amplitude of the fluctuation however uh, it is important to note that the displacement time plot that we have uh, shown here is far more complicated in reality because here as i said we are considering only a single normal mode of oscillation but in reality there is an infinite infinity of normal modes in the mechanical structure and the displacement of the mechanical oscillator at the position of the laser spot you see uh, the position of the laser spot here the the this uh, displacement consists of a superposition of all such normal modes of vibration and all these different normal modes of vibration has different frequencies so it is better to Fourier decompose it and look at the Fourier spectrum the Fourier transform of the displacement x of the harmonic oscillator uh, in a time interval from say 0 to t so let us say the Fourier transformation of the displacement is denoted by x tilde omega and it is Fourier transformation of the displacement x of t so e to the power i omega t is the Fourier kernel then we are going to integrate in time in the time interval say 0 to tau and this is the normalization factor here 1 by square root of tau so this is the Fourier transformation of the displacement now this is obviously a complex quantity and average of this quantity is zero because we know that if we take the average of this x of t for harmonic oscillator this is equal to zero uh, so better take the mod of this quantity and square it and then plot uh, x till the what i am saying is that you better take the mod of this particular quantity x till the of omega okay okay let me write it properly so you have x till the omega you take the mod and then you square it now let us plot x till the omega mod square uh, this quantity versus frequency omega and actually a typical plot is already shown here as you can uh, see from this plot this is actually called noise spectrum this plot is the so-called noise spectrum of the mechanical oscillator okay as you can see uh, we are obtaining a pretty fluctuating spectrum here however in laboratory we will make a series of measurements not just one measurement so we need to take average of many such spectrums and it means that it is better to plot you better take this x tilde of omega mod square and then you take the average and plot this average quantity versus the frequency and when we plot it this plot is called average noise spectrum of the mechanical oscillator a typical plot is now shown here so this is the average average noise spectrum average noise spectrum of the mechanical oscillator of the mechanical oscillator one thing you can quickly notice is that uh, 
the spectrum is symmetric around omega is equal to zero and what it here it means that x tilde of minus omega is equal to x tilde of omega so this is what i mean by a symmetry and this is a typical characteristics of noise spectrum in the classical regime okay now in fact uh, it can be shown that this particular quantity x tilde of omega mod square and if we take the average and this is also denoted by this symbol as xx of omega this is actually called noise spectrum this is known as noise spectrum this quantity is referred to as noise spectrum it can be shown uh, because we know the what is x tilde of omega so it's very easy to show that this is equal to or let me just write here that i can write x of omega this noise spectrum is equal to 1 by tau 0 to tau dt1 dt2 uh, e to the power i omega t1 minus t2 and we have x of t1 x of t2 it's very easy if you find it difficult uh, don't worry we will actually address it in our problem solving session okay this is what i have and this particular quantity you see average of x uh, at t1 and x at t2 this is known as correlator this is called correlator so let me write here this is an important quantity displacement at two different times this is known as the correlator or the correlation function and it basically gives us the information of the displacement of the oscillator at two different times now in the steady state no point in time is special because the steady state and the correlator will depend only on the time difference so it can be shown just by changing variables that i can express in the steady state sxx of omega which is the noise spectrum and this is x tilde omega mod square and the average so it can be shown that it is minus infinity to plus infinity because all times are equal equivalent so therefore this correlator i can just change the time uh, variable and i can write it like this okay or this is also sometime it is uh, symbolically represented by this xx of omega and clearly either this quantity or this this is the same quantity uh, this means that or rather let us say this is is simply this quantity is simply the fourier transform fourier transform uh, of the correlator of the correlator or the correlation function correlation function so what you see basically is that the noise spectrum is nothing but the fourier transform of the correlation function and this is ex is known as and it is referred to as winner kinsin theorem winner kinsin theorem so winner kinsin theorem states that the noise spectrum is nothing but it's simply the fourier transform of the correlation function or the correlator now one can very easily calculate the area under the noise spectrum so area under the noise spectrum so what i mean by that is you just have to by conventionally we'll put 2 omega this will divide it by 2 pi and this is the quantity we can calculate and 
you know that this would be d of dt because we know what is this noise spectrum is then i have here this is from minus infinity to plus infinity d omega by 2 pi e to the power i omega t okay and then i have x of t x of 0 and this is very easy to calculate because you know this is nothing but the delta function so this will lead us to this will get it as x0 square here and because all times are equal equivalent in steady state so i can simply write it at x square so what you see that the area under the spectrum give us the variance of x so area under the spectrum uh, gives us the variance of x and we know that the variance of x is directly related to the temperature of the harmonic oscillator in thermal equilibrium okay now let us find out the relationship between the noise spectrum so relationship relationship between the noise spectrum uh, and the linear response of the system and linear response of the system linear response of the mechanical system now this linear response of the system is characterized by a quantity called susceptibility of the mechanical oscillator so linear response is characterized i will explain it characterized by a quantity quantity called mechanical susceptibility mechanical susceptibility and it is denoted by chi of omega at a particular frequency okay and this relation between the noise spectrum and the linear response of the system in statistical physics it is known as the fluctuation dissipation theorem fluctuation dissipation theorem or in short it is called fdt now we will actually not discuss it in details only the theorem is needed for us and that is what i am now going to state the fluctuation dissipation theorem or fdt in short could be stated as follows the noise spectrum uh, sx omega or also it is denoted by this quantity by this uh, xx of omega is related to the imaginary part of the susceptibility via the following relation uh, this relation is given in the classical limit okay now let me explain it and first let me explain about the susceptibility because you already know what is uh, this noise spectrum uh, term you are already maybe clear about it so regarding susceptibility you know that we have encountered this term called susceptibility in many places in physics and other areas of science for example if you recall the so-called polarization say the po polarization p that you encounter in electromagnetism which is the electric dipole moment per unit volume in a dielectric arises due to the application of an electric field and this polarization p is directly proportional to the uh, application uh, the external electric field that is applied and it is actually expressed in this form so p is equal to epsilon zero chi of e and here chi is the electric susceptibility it is the proportionality constant and this is what we call electric susceptibility electric susceptibility okay so what happens is that uh, this polarization sometimes it's very strong at a particular frequency of the electric field 
and hence it is also written in this form that this polarization is a very strong at this particular frequency corresponding to the application of the electric field at that particular frequency and this proportionality constant would be uh, this way chi of omega now chi all as i said this is electric susceptibility and this is actually called linear susceptibility linear electric susceptibility it is linear because you see the polarization is the linearly dependent on the electric field however there is if the electric field strength is very large uh, then then nonlinear terms are also has to be incorporated but we will not go into those domain here we will assume that the electric field that is applied to the dielectric is uh, not very strong so in that case the polarization in electric field they share a linear relationship between them and that is the breeze between this relation is actually given by the so-called linear susceptibility now in the similar way the average displacement say delta x of the movable mirror in an optomechanical system is directly proportional to the radiation pressure force that is important on the important on the mechanical mirror okay so this is in opto mechanics we can have the similar thing so obviously hopefully you are now guessing it where this linear susceptibility term will come now again here also the response of the mirror to this radiation pressure force is strong at a particular frequency say omega and this is represented in this form so this displacement of the movable mirror it's a very strong response is there at frequency omega or i can simply write it it as the this displacement at frequency omega and this is equal to the force radiation pressure force at the frequency omega and the proportionality constant here is a uh, given by this term and this is your uh, susceptibility term here this is called mechanical susceptibility because we are now dealing with mechanics so this is mechanical susceptibility of the movable mirror or the optomechanical uh, then mechanical system susceptibility and uh, by the way here as you see there are two x i am putting the first x is related to the response that we are looking uh, because we are looking at the response is this one that is the displacement and the second x here uh, this second x is related to the direction along which the force is applied so here the second x that means that the force is applied along the x direction and the response is also measured in the x direction that's what it means so susceptibility is actually a complex quantity and uh, because it is a complex quantity so let me write here that this mechanical susceptibility is a complex quantity and that means that it has a real part and the imaginary part and the imaginary part of this susceptibility is related to the dissipation of the system so imaginary part of this mechanical susceptibility is related to the dissipation of the system uh, let me explain this actually dissipation of the system to make you understand it let me go back to the case of electric susceptibility uh, where we had uh, this say polarization is directly proportional to the electric field now you all of you must have done electromagnetic theory and in electromagnetic theory you know that the so-called displacement vector you know that is related to the polarization by this expression you know epsilon zero e plus the polarization who is actually is uh, related to this epsilon zero is the electric permittivity in free space and epsilon is the electric permittivity in the medium and from here as we have p is equal to this so immediately we can write okay let me write here this means that i have epsilon e is equal to epsilon 0 e 
plus epsilon 0 chi into e and what it means that i have epsilon is equal to epsilon 0 into 1 plus chi that is the electric susceptibility and uh, this quantity epsilon by epsilon 0 is equal to 1 plus chi now if you recall that uh, refractive index okay just i'm giving it a very you know it's not exactly the way we should but just to recall we should do but uh, just tentatively let us understand it this way that speed of light is square root of epsilon 0 mu 0 and v is the velocity of or the speed of light in the medium that is uh, again 1 by square root of epsilon and mu if the medium is non-magnetic then mu is equal to mu 0 so let us we have a, that kind of a medium so you have n is equal to epsilon by epsilon 0 square root so therefore this quantity is simply equal to 1 plus chi is nothing but refractive index square and this if i can also if say chi is a small quantity then i can write n is equal to nearly equal to 1 plus uh, half of chi and the uh, refractive index is a complex quantity so it has a real part and an imaginary part then i have this one plus half susceptibility has also a real part and an imaginary part so let me uh, write it uh, sorry let me write it this way i into chi of i so the refractive index real part of the refractive index is equal to one plus half of chi of r and the imaginary part of the refractive index is related to the uh, imaginary part of the susceptibility like this now you know that if a plain electromagnetic wave passes through a medium its electric field at a distance say z is given by this e of z you may be aware of lambert beard law so i'm going to that here so say electric field initial is amplitude is e0 and as it passes through a distance z so you have this phase vector here and also you know that this k is the propagation vector k is equal to omega by c into the refractive index okay so therefore i can write because the refractive index is a uh, complex quantity so i can write it as e0 e to the power minus omega by c the imaginary part of the refractive index then i have this propagation uh, part of the electric field that is i into omega by c real part of the refractive index minus omega t so this part represents the propagating part and this represents the amplitude now what you see okay here z is also there uh, here also z is there so what you see that the amplitude is as the electric field is propagating through the medium amplitude is decreasing is decreasing uh, and this uh, dissipation of the amplitude is related to the imaginary part of the refractive index and who is in turn is related to the imaginary part of the susceptibility now you see um, that this uh, imaginary part of the susceptibility is generally related to the dissipation so hope you are getting now convinced so in the similar vein uh, we can say that uh, even in the mechanical case the imaginary part of the susceptibility mechanical susceptibility is related to the dissipation of the mechanical system now you if we uh, go back to the fluctuation dissipation theorem here as you see this particular quantity uh, the susceptibility is independent of temperature it only depends on the spring constant the damping rate mass etc but the you know that the fluctuation do depend on temperature and hence in the fluctuation dissipation theorem the temperature t is also appearing in the expression here now if we go into the quantum limit which we will discuss in a tutorial problem in the in the quantum limit in the quantum limit the fdt the fluctuation dissipation theorem is actually given by this expression that is um, or this uh, noise spectrum is equal to 
it is equal to twice of h cross divided by 1 minus e to the power minus h cross omega by kbt and this is related to do again imaginary part of the um, mechanical susceptibility at high temperature the quantum version coincides with the classical version and we will discuss about it in the problem solving session to appreciate fluctuation dissipation theorem let us consider a classical damped harmonic oscillator so you know the equation of motion for a classical damped harmonic oscillator is given by this expression here uh, this small m is the mass of the harmonic oscillator this capital omega omega is the resonance frequency so omega is the resonance frequency of the harmonic oscillator this gamma is the damping coefficient this is the damping coefficient and this f is the external force this is the external force and f thermal you know even if there is no external force in thermal equilibrium we are uh, and also you can get the hint from this presence of this damping term that even if there is no external force there is always some kind of a thermal environment and this thermal environment is quantified by this term f thermal okay now the idea in defining susceptibility is to look at the average response of the harmonic oscillator and because this f thermal is a fluctuating term so while we average it then we will be able to get rid of the thermal force and we are we on averaging we are now going to obtain this one so if we average it we'll get m x double dot this is the average then m omega square average of x plus m gamma average of x dot and f thermal average would go to zero so we'll just left out with this external force only and by the way you uh, let me just clarify that when i say x dot i mean to say the time derivative of x okay this is what i mean now it's always better to work in the frequency domain so if we work in the frequency domain by that i mean say if we take x is equal to say x tilde e to the power i omega t and f is equal to say f of omega e to the power i omega t then if i take x dot then i will get x tilde e to the power i omega t into i omega and which is simply i omega uh, x so as you can see i can always replace delta t or dt here i can replace this dt by i omega so that's the prescription when we go over to the frequency domain so taking up this prescription so d2 dt2 would become minus omega square right taking this prescription going over to the frequency domain uh, okay let me write here going over to frequency domain i can write it as minus m omega square plus m capital omega square minus i m omega gamma and here i have this x uh, let me just write average of this but it is in now frequency domain and this is equal to f of omega okay from because this displacement is very small so i can simply to emphasize that i can write it as delta x of omega so i have delta x of omega is equal to 1 by m capital omega square minus omega square so here i have omega square minus i m omega gamma into f of omega okay now you recall that 
this is the response of the harmonic oscillator and it is directly proportional to the the force that is applied external force and this proportionality constant as you know this is given by the so-called susceptibility of the mechanical oscillator so we can easily read out the expression for the susceptibility for this classical damped harmonic oscillator and that is equal to 1 divided by m capital omega square minus omega square minus i m omega gamma this expression can be uh, simplified but before that as you can see uh, this susceptibility is a complex quantity and it has a real part and the imaginary part and imaginary part of the susceptibility is very straightforward to get and you can easily get it and if you do the algebra then the imaginary part of the susceptibility will turn out to be m omega small omega gamma divided by m capital omega square omega square then whole thing whole square here plus m omega gamma whole square so this is what we have as the imaginary part now you see imaginary part of the susceptibility is associated with the noise spectrum as per our fluctuation dissipation theorem so this noise spectrum which is actually the same as this term and this is equal to twice kbt by omega and imaginary part of the susceptibility so therefore the expression for the noise spectrum this particular term is equal to if i put the terms from the susceptibility i have twice kbt m uh, gamma divided by m capital omega square minus omega square this whole square plus m omega gamma whole square okay this expression can be further simplified if say if gamma is small dissipation is small is small enough and you will have say gamma is far smaller than the frequency say gamma is far smaller than frequency omega then we can expand we can expand around omega is equal to capital omega then this expression for the noise spectrum this uh, this expression can be further simplified and you can do it very easily so i'm leaving it to you to do it otherwise we'll do it in a problem solving session so we'll have kbt divided by twice m omega square divided uh, into gamma divided by omega minus capital omega whole square plus gamma by 2 whole square so this is the expression we'll have now you see this expression is has a lorentzian form and the typical plot would look like this so let me just plot it so we'll have here the noise spectrum let me put it here in the y-axis and omega in the y x uh, x axis then we'll have a plot like this so we'll have a plot something like this so you will see that this is symmetric uh, around omega is equal to zero and the full width at half maximum here you can easily find it out full width at half maximum would be gamma here and what are the other things that we can find out we will find that the peak is situated at capital omega at the resonance frequency in both the cases here all both the uh, maybe i'm not drawing it properly but you take it as a as a completely symmetric around omega is equal to zero and what are the other things that we can find out from this simple diagram uh, couple of things one is you can as you can see you can find out the resonance frequency the resonance frequency of the harmonic oscillator omega can be read out from this plot and also what you can do you can find out 
um, the damping rate we can read out read out gamma the damping rate just by measuring the full width at half maximum of the spectrum and also what we can find out we can find the find out the temperature temperature of the harmonic oscillator by working out the area find out the temperature of the harmonic oscillator by working out the area and which is very straightforward because already i explained it i think earlier so what i have to find out i have to find out this integral d omega by 2 pi and this is the noise spectrum this area you can work it out it has to be twice so twice because i have two peaks then i have one by 2 pi uh, i have 2 kbt by uh, twice m omega square okay from this expression here so okay so i will have say minus infinity to plus infinity d omega gamma divided by omega minus capital omega square plus gamma by 2 whole square okay if you do the calculations and it's very straightforward please do that you will get twice kbt divided by m omega uh, sorry this would be capital omega this would be m omega square and this is nothing but the variance okay so that's how you'll be able to find out the temperature also just by finding out the area let me stop here for today in this lecture we have completed our discussion on basic physics qualitatively and uh, also we discussed the so-called fluctuation dissipation theorem which basically prepares us for discussion of kvt quantum optomechanics qualitative uh, quantitatively from the next class onwards and in the next class we are going to discuss the classical regime of kvt quantum optomechanics so see you in the next class thank you